Did I hear Lauren say something about me? No? Nothing? Must have been. Yeah, must have been something else. Goodbye, Lauren. Okay, she's leaving now. <laughs> Welcome again, guys. I'm so glad y'all are in worship today. I'm Pastor Michael, and uh, we're starting a new series today called Extraordinary. Uh, and we're going to be, or Extraordinary, if you will, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the means of grace. And some of you are like, say what? Um, we're going to explain that to you in the midst of the service. So um, I'm glad that you're in worship with us today. We are uh, finally going to just kind of t take a little step away from the book of Acts, which we've been in for the past five weeks. And we're going to go to 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. We're going to be in verse, excuse me, chapter 11, reading verse 23 through 28. And as uh, you heard from uh, Lauren's children's time, that we're going to be talking a little about communion today. And when you hear these words read, they might sound a bit familiar. That's a good thing. Let's hear these words from the letter to the Corinthians. <clears throat> For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord is an unworthy man, in, un, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. My friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God, and together we all say, thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> what would you do? If a complete stranger walked up to you and asked to take your picture and then asked you to tell you, tell them your story. It's a weird way to introduce a sermon, isn't it? <laughs> but it was a question that the NPR writer asked a man by the name of Brandon Stanton, who is the creator of a thing called Humans of New York. Anyone ever heard of Humans of New York before? Yeah? Seeing some nods out there, some of you not sure. It started in 2010, and it was done by this guy named Brandon, who at the time was a, in finance, an executive in finance um, in the city of Chicago. And he left Chicago, and he went uh, and picked up a camera and took it to the city he loved, New York, and started taking pictures of the people in the city that he loved. And thousands of, of pictures and stories later, uh, he became actually kind of famous in a way. He's been asked to take pictures all over the place. He now has a few photo books uh, that you can um, uh, turn through to, to read. He's got an incredible website and an awesome Instagram feed if you want to follow it. And also, he has expanded beyond just the, the bounds of New York City, which is a big city, <laughs> uh, to going all over the place from Pakistan and, and Iran and the Ukraine and Jerusalem, just to, you know, name a few. He even worked with the Brooklyn Independent School District in New York, uh, uh, one of the most impoverished school districts in the United States. And he began taking pictures of students and, and teachers and, and, and um, administrators and sharing their stories. And by doing that, he was able to raise a million dollars for this school district to help kind of upgrade some of their uh, uh, needs uh, in technology so they could begin to educate their students. It's pretty incredible what he's done. I love one of my favorite quotes from that NPR interview I got to uh, watch. Uh, he says this in it. He says, the great thing about New York is that on an ordinary day, if you sit in one place long enough, the whole world comes to you. It's hard. Sometimes, if you really think about it, when was the last time you had an ordinary day? Have you thought about that lately? I think in the post-Harvey world that we live in, it's sort of hard to think about an ordinary day. It might just seem like a figment of your imagination, right? There's a new normal for us. That's the phrase I've heard from a lot of you all and myself, right? After this storm. But ordinary, in general, 
is not something I necessarily strive to to be or or have. I don't wake up in the morning, get on my knees and pray, God, let this be an ordinary day. I don't go to my favorite burger place and say, I'll have it ordinary style, please. Thank you. Appreciate it. I don't, uh, if there's a resume I'm filling out and it says, how are his pastoral skills? I don't write ordinary or preaching abilities. I don't write solidly ordinary. Hopefully you all agree with that. Um, (laughs) If you don't, we can talk after the service. It will just take a few minutes. No, uh, uh, yeah, right? We don't particularly want to be known as ordinary. We want to be fantastic. We want to be amazing. We want to be the creme de la creme, right? We want to be the top of the class. We want to be extraordinary. Ordinary is not necessarily something that we strive or hope to achieve. In the church, we have something called the the liturgical calendar. Now, just to clarify, some people ask me, uh, it's not a 12-month calendar of Jesus doing kind of cheesy poses by any means, okay? Uh, I've had to actually say that to people who weren't sure about that. The Advent, excuse me, not the Advent, but the, the liturgical calendar is our way as a church of keeping attuned with different seasons that we experience, much like Advent, right? We're coming up to that here at the end of November, early December. There's Lent. You all know Lent, those 40 days leading up to Holy Week. And of course, Easter. And then there are special Sundays like Pentecost Sunday and All Saints Sunday and Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, right? That calendar keeps us up to date. In fact, here's a kind of an image of what that calendar looks like a bit. You see kind of the usual suspects up there, Advent, Christmas, Lent. Yeah, those look good. But if you look, you don't have to look very closely. (laughs) What's in the green there? Or ordinary time. Kind of odd. In fact, that's the exact season that we're in right now. And I got to know, who's the guy or gal who came up with ordinary time? I could give you a hundred different suggestions for a better name than that. How about really cool time? Super hip time? Those days waiting for Advent time. Anything but ordinary time, please. I mean, it's so blah, right? I mean, to some, when you hear ordinary time, you might just be thinking like, uh, it's a time to kind of vacation, right? Relax spiritually, like, or maybe like get prepared for Advent because you know it's going to be crazy. You know you're going to be on Amazon buying the gifts for people and running from place to place. Or perhaps it's that preparation time before Lent, because if I'm going to give up chocolate for 40 days, ooh, I'm going to eat some chocolate during ordinary time. Right? It's ordinary. Or at its worst, you might think that's the time where there doesn't have to really be any spiritual growth at all. I mean, if it's just ordinary, what good can come from that? (laughs) I think that was in the minds of the Corinthians, that thought, what good is ordinary? As we hear them mumbling and bumbling and grumbling in the scriptures today, you see the thrill of the early church, what we read in Acts, right? The start of the church, right? That spiritual awakening had begun to kind of die down. Everything was on the rise, the popularity, the new people were converted to the faith. Everything was exciting and happening. And as it was rising, it started to begin to kind of plateau. You know what I'm talking about? There's all this energy around this, but things were starting to kind of get plain Jane. And with nothing particularly exciting in the horizon, The Corinthians began to reflect that in the way they practiced their spiritual practices, right? Their prayers were lazy. Their worship was lackluster. Instead of eating with their community, with their friends, their brothers and sisters in Christ, it's documented that they were eating alone, private meals, instead of eating together. They had put themselves in cruise control spiritually, (laughs) It wasn't anything exciting. You might call it ordinary time. Paul got word of these actions, and he wrote what we know today as the first letter to the Corinthians. Now, 
There are 16 chapters in all, in all of Corinthians, and that first chapter is kind of uh, upbeat. Um, Paul sort of like applauding them. Yay, good job. But the next 15 chapters, y'all, he comes for them. He goes in on them, and he begins to talk to them about all the ways that they are messing up. And it's hard to think, right? Because 1 Corinthians 13 is in there. Y'all know love is patient. You probably had it read at your wedding. Love is kind. Love does not end. Yeah, but Paul is really still upset with them, even during this beautiful love passage. Um, Because he's critiquing them on their division, on their immorality, on their inability to follow the ways of Christ. And one prime example is a scripture that we read today. You see, Paul has, knows the quality and quantity and the power behind what can happen at this holy meal at communion that he shared with them. And remember, communion is not something that Paul drummed up in his mind. It came from the work and practice of Christ who enacted it with his disciples and taught them what to do after he died, taught them the night before his death. It's what we celebrate on Monday, Thursday, each year. And they were coming to the table, as Paul began to hear, out of obligation, rather to be fed and to be nourished. It was just another bite of food for them. It had lost its taste. It was ordinary. Paul can't believe what he's heard. (laughs) And he says in his own way in 1 Corinthians 11, boys and girls, you better cleanse your palate for that food has nothing to do with its taste. It has to do with the taster. That food, that bread and juice, that bread and wine has not lost its power and possibilities. You have lost your ability to see this very simple meal that Christ taught his disciples and to imagine it to be something so much more than what it actually is. You've lost that, guys and gals. When I thought about that image, it made me think of one of my favorite movies as a kid. It's a movie called Hook. Um, It's the modern telling, y'all heard of Hook? Yeah, yeah. It's a modern telling of the story of Peter Pan and the late Robin Williams plays Peter Pan. And he goes back to um, Neverland to sit with the Lost Boys. Uh, In the 930 service, I said the disciples. That was a mix of words. He sat with the Lost Boys at the table. And as he's gathered around them, he's really hungry. And there's food, but not what he is expecting. And the Lost Boys help him perhaps transform that. Let's take a look at this scene. Say grace. Bless this, O Lord. Grace! What's the 
to you. Where's the real food? If you can't imagine yourself being Peter Pan, you won't be Peter Pan, so eat up! Eat what? There's nothing here. Gandhi ate more than this. Don't you remember this used to be your favorite game? finally doing it. You're finally seeing it. It's a powerful moment in this little funny movie, right? I mean, he finally is able to see the meal before him, not as just another bite of food to fill his belly, but a chance to experience, to participate with others, a feast far greater than his wildest imagination. To make sense, Paul uses his bread and butter, no pun intended, of Christ's words to help paint the image for these Corinthians who can't see it, just see it as a a meal as opposed to an experience. It's those words I get to say at the table every time I get behind there. We call it the words of institution here in the church. It's these words from 1 Corinthians. This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after Christ took the cup, he's saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Friends, this is not a cup of convenience. It's not bread that we feed to the birds after the service. It's so much more. It's a practice of remembrance. It's a chance to eat with the saints, those great godly men and women who have gone before us. It's a chance to delight in the incarnation, right? That's why Jesus came to earth, the incarnation. God who is both, who is both divine and both human. God made flesh to come and dwell among us. But one more piece to that. Not only to dwell among us, God wanted to dwell within us at communion. You see, this meal here is not just a snack before brunch today. It is a chance to experience tangibly God's grace given to each and every one of us. And that's an important thing to remember throughout this uh, entirety of the sermon series that we've begun called Extraordinary a long-standing tradition in the Methodist church comes from the belief that to, uh, grace, God's grace, can be found through uh, channels appointed by God uh, that we might experience. Some of those channels are prayer, uh, worship, fasting, stewardship, uh, participating in missions both locally and globally, uh, connecting to someone and a group of people through small groups, and of course today, as we've talked about, communion. John Wesley called these channels, here's the connecting point, he called them the means of grace. And he defined the means of grace like this. They are outward signs, words or actions ordained by God and appointed for this end. Hear this, to be what? To be ordinary channels whereby God might convey to God's creation the grace given to us all. In essence, Wesley here is saying that those spiritual practices that you participate in are far much more than just trying to one-up your other Christian friends. They're to be done not to just be in good standing with God. They are to be outlets to which we as Christians today might experience the transformational grace that God gives us. Now, I know for some of you in this room, you might be thinking to yourself, but how can, com- uh, how can communion be transformative? 
uh, it's a pretty ordinary practice. I mean, how, how do we make that connection happen? I mean, I do the same thing each week, Charbo. I, I make my way down uh, the aisle. I hold my hands out. I get a piece of bread. Sometimes I wish the bread was bigger, but that's between me and God. And I, I get this bread, and I, I get it, and I have to dip it into the cup. And then I, I take it, and I, if I've got something on my mind, I guess, I'll go and kneel and pray, and then I make my way back in the seats. I mean, how can that be transformational grace that you speak of? Well, two thoughts I've had this week. First, hear this. There is no right way to come up to the altar to do this. Of course, there's a difference between just going through the motions and then actually coming to the table and listening to the words being said and and taking a piece of Christ with you and going out into the world and sharing that. But... Like the ways that we express grief, like the ways that we express joy, each way that we enter into that channel of grace is different from all of us. But the one hurdle that I have heard from so many of you and even happens in my own life is that when you come forward to this table that you present yourself just as you are. You don't have to come here acting like, wow, your boss tells you you have to act at work. You don't have to come to this table dressed like all the other girlfriends in your social club. You don't have to act the same way that all the rules say and social rules of your high school or junior high whenever you make your way this way. All that God asks you at communion is to bring your truest self and let the Spirit of God begin to work in you that way. And secondly, is to remember who we do this meal with. Paul explains to the Corinthians that this is not just an ordinary meal to be done in private. It is meant to be done together. The meal, this meal is cosmic. It is, it has cultural significance for when we make our way to the table, we follow in the footsteps of, of generations before us. I love watching sometimes you heard your children up here. All right, come on this way, right? Come this way, right? Grab the bread, right? Don't forget that was you at one time. Your mama, your papa, your, your grandma and grandpa, whoever that was helped you make your way up to the altar at one time. And the same goes for them. And generations beyond that and beyond that and beyond that, we are following a tradition that has been there since the upper room, y'all. That's powerful stuff. And the same way, likewise, when we break bread, we are doing it with churches across this city and across this world. It's the reason why every single week I say from behind the table, I say, this is not Memorial Drive's table. This is not a Methodist table. And some of you are like, wait, uh, I give good money to this church, and that is our table. Um, Please don't give it to anybody else. That's not what I mean. It is our table. But what we're saying here is imagine something greater. This is God's table. All are welcome to come. And whether you worship at Second Baptist or St. Martin's Episcopal, whether you're speaking it in English or Spanish or Sudanese or in sign language, when you come to this table, All of those differences from denominational to to differences in in whatever category fall to the wayside as we come together. One of my favorite attributes of that human of New York, humans of New York that I was talking about earlier, is the way that Brandon, the, the creator of it, treats the people he interviews. One example is that when, they want to, when the people want to have their story told, but they say, you know, I don't want to have my identity exposed. Can you just not take a picture of my face? Brandon honors that, but he does something in a unique way. Instead of take a picture of their face, he takes a picture of their hands. Here's an example of a few of those that I saw this week while looking online. You see, Brandon believes that a lot can be conveyed in a person's hands, whether they are scars or scrapes or tattoos or jewelry. Hands tell a story. They tell what you've done in your life. They tell how you've helped someone. They tell who you've held. They tell what you've built and what you've broken down. But at communion, as different of a story that those hands tell, one thing is the same. We each come forward and we hold our palms up. 
And for just one moment, even for just one small second in time, we are fed both by body and soul. We are together. We are one, equally involved and equally beloved by God. And when we outstretch our hands to receive that bread, friends, we are outstretching our hands like Christ did so many years ago. And by doing that, we are saying that they, we have belief in something. Sometimes it's hard to believe in things in this day and age. Am I right? It's hard when you turn on the news or you see stuff at school or, or at your workplace, and you're like, how do we even get by? But by extending those hands, you say, I believe somehow that God's grace can be seen in me and just maybe in turn, it can be seen through me by others. So, is communion ordinary? You bet it is. And we're going to keep doing it every single week here as we make our way to this table. That's not going to be changing at any time. But it doesn't always have to be like we're going through the motions of things. It doesn't have to be the same every time, friends. Because when we come to this table, we participate in an ancient story, God's story, woven within ours, so that we might actually find a way, a means of God's grace in us. So my friends, I invite you today to taste and hear, to taste and know, to taste and see that the Lord is indeed good. May it be so. Amen. Let us pray. A loving and, and gracious God for a chance to come to your table. Sometimes we don't realize of what a great gift it is. Other times we, our society, finds ways of saying, no, you're not welcome. Not this time. Or you got to do this or look this way. That's not the case with your table, God. You invite us all to open up our, our palms to reach out, to experience that grace within us. And that's our hope today. That's our hope always. May it be so. Amen.